here. It's a round number and it's yeah, still growing, yeah. but we can uh, go. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're super happy to have you here in our first webinar of the year. Um, I'm Beatriz, I'm a design systems uh, advocate here uh, with Supernova and with me is the lovely Raquel that is uh, at the moment doing design ops in uh, Volkswagen. She's also a teacher teaching design systems and also a Figma community advocate, right? Yes, yes. Well, well introduced. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Super excited to be sharing this time with you. Just to give you an introduction, like a brief overview, uh, this meeting is being recorded. We're going to share it uh, in YouTube after we finish. We also have a file and some goodies to share at the end. And if you need to turn on the captions, uh, feel free. You can have that option uh, in the Zoom bar. And I believe that's everything. Uh, we're also having an open Q&A at the end. So please drop your questions. I'll be paying some atten paying attention to them. And if we don't answer to all of them, uh, we will follow up, certainly. And that's it. I guess I'll give you the floor, Raquel. Super nice to yes. have you here. Excited to yeah. learn from you about what you- Thank you so much as well for the invitation. For me, it's always fun to explore more and more. Uh, and yeah, to be quite humble and honest, this is also as well a, a work in progress for me to learn. So in case you find out anything that I have on the file that is slightly weird or you would do it in a different way, please just uh, reach out and we can exchange some ideas because it's a lot to learn and to process. But hopefully I can teach you or learn or even demo some one or two things with you uh, today. So that's the, the main goal. Uh, at least we can exchange because it's such a new topic. I think Absolutely. there's so many ways to do it. So I think it's good for us to keep open mind when we see something different, right? Absolutely. Even doing this, uh, we were also discussing that, that this is a very, very new topic and might change the yeah. way we do certain things and how we document. Yeah, and yeah, for sure. Like, yeah, for sure. Uh, and I will also give some uh, opinions about it while I will... Um, show it so i think it will be very interesting for us to dig in and see all the the possibilities and the potential like when we th i think design system when you feel that you are too comfortable you should think twice and dig in <laughs> because that's probably something <laughs> that you need wrong. to learn again yeah <laughs> I, <laughs> so I that's think great it's, it's uh, always challenging yeah i think it's a topic that we have to keep it open mind to always constantly learning which is quite exciting but don't be you know overwhelming with i don't know yet about this and that so one of the reasons we are doing actually this live streams is to help you on that. So hopefully you can be more comfortable about this topic today. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so a quick intro. Uh, you can also read it a little bit uh, on the article that I wrote for Supernova regarding this. Uh, uh, basically all the pages that we have here, I will I, I talk a little bit on, on the article as well. So we will demo a little bit what I wrote there. But just to keep it always, everybody on the loop and exactly what we were talking, it's always important for designers that are doing design systems and also devs that are involved to understand the, the, the logic behind design tokens, right? And I think it's important just to clarify a definition because one of the most cliche questions was, what's the difference between variables and tokens, right? They are the same, they are not. What's, what's the game goal? Uh, why Figma then uh, name it uh, tokens, right? So that's basically uh, what I've been, what I will teach you today. So basically, the the research that I give you, it's based on the definition that the W three C community group defined as design tokens. So design tokens are uh, indivisible uh, pieces of the design system, such as color, spacing, typography, scale, and basically. The main core of the def definition of this is that is an information that is associated with a name uh, and then therefore a minimum name value pair. So something so simple like uh, backgrounds and then you put the X code based on that color of the background color, right? So the, 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 the main potential why we have all of this effort and work is because you can reuse the values but mostly you can create more source of truth on your design system, which is basically one of the main goals of having a design system, right? You can guarantee that multiple people are using the same 
color for a specific background. So you don't have to worry if the X, oh, X code is slightly different because someone was there manually changing, you know, it was very <laughs> uh, hard those times. Um, but then the main magic is that you can restore uh, values. And the, the main difference is that Figma with variables can store those values and reusable and reuse them not only for design properties that we associate mostly with the CSS, but you can also do it on prototyping, which is quite a huge potential. It could give you like two live streams just about it. But basically Figma did a little bit of upgrade uh, on the concept of the token. So uh, to respond to that, design tokens are not the same as variables, but variables can store design tokens. So when we are naming this, like, okay, but how do we name tokens and how do we name variables is also a very uh, qu a very common question on this topic. And what I advise you also to uh, read uh, the WC3, uh, 3C, sorry, community group that explains you, uh, and, you and you have the links on the article, uh, explains all the properties that you should consider when you are considering to create a token, which is basically the CSS properties mostly. You have to define the colors, dimensions, font weights. Um, then afterwards on another layer, strokes, borders, shadows. And the main difference between these two is that the singular is one value and composite, it could have more than one value associated. So your border could be, uh, you know, uh, how much it is like one, two, three pixels, and then the color associated, for instance, that's the main difference between singular and composite. But the most and the cliche um, message that I would like to give you, even it could be a little bit frustrated for you, is that the, the token naming convention, it really has to be something that you have to appropriate to your reality into your company, because you might duplicate how GitLab or Atlassians does, but it might not work for you because it's not it was not made for you or for your team or for your company. So what I best advise you is that you can Inspire, of course, how big companies do it with all the free resources that we have on internet, but then do a teamwork and try to map and to construct a nomenclature that works for you. And if you are considering to do variables, it could be uh, quite useful to listen to me today because you will see that it will also impact the, the way that you're naming uh, tokens as well. Uh, yeah, good. Someone uh, already uh, shared the article. Thank you. Uh, and you can dig in a little bit uh, where I can also share when start using variables or not, pros and cons about it, if you're using design uh, token studios and so on. Um, and now I basically will do a demo that I tried to do it on the article, but on a live stream, it will be more satisfying to see. So for instance, on the usual, um, a workflow at the moment when you're not using variables, we have styles, right? And people ask, what's the main difference between styles and variables? Basically, variables will have the magic of actually work and update all your source of truths and will be so much easier when you have to update in, in large scale. So for instance, here, these are a very dummy components, okay, that I made for the article. So for instance, we have buttons, okay? And on this, and then we have numbers and inputs and so on. And then the usual uh, process, in case you are dipping on the, on the tokens, is that you usually define a global collection, a global tokens, which, which global, uh, w w what is this in practical? So I Google it and there's a possibility of having 10 million colors inside of the world. And you don't want to compete with that, right? You want to make sure that on the global uh, collection, you have all the possible colors that you might use in your work. And that's when you see most often those lists that where, where you have like grade 10, grade 20, grade 30, until grade 90, for instance. So on the global level, the global tokens is where you define all the possible colors that you might have on your design system. Even if you'd never use that tone, at least it's there, right? But you at least can find the 10 million possible colors of the world to 100, let's say. Then on the semantical, uh, on the semantic uh, level or purpose uh, as well, some, some of them might call purpose, 
you basically give uh, a reason why you're using that color and for what for. So let's say that I have here a uh, global brand red and I want to define a background. So this will be a background accent, for instance. So I give a purpose to this color. That's basically all the logic on the semantical level. So the big magic is that when, when, when you were doing this on the styles, you might have here on the right side, the global ones, as you can see, this is a very global collection for the demo purposes. And then we have the semantic ones where I basically define some content uh, uh, values and background ones. And the big magic between uh, styles and variables if, is that if I change for, for reason, let's say that I want to change this red and instead of being red, it will become another color. The thing is when I change these values, it won't change this ones because they are not uh, attached to each other. They don't have any link between them. So if I change this to a green, it will only change to the, to the components that have the styles on the global uh, purposes. It won't change this one. But if we do this on the variable sides, if we use it as a variable, which you will have the same nomenclature, and how do I do this? I go here and on my right, right side, I will have your uh, tiny menu that's called local variables. And when I click here, I will have your collections that I already defined. And then here on the global collection and to create a collection, you put this three dots and then you can create a collection. Like this is a new collection. And then it will show up here. <laughs> You can also delete it in case you want it or change the name. But then here on the global level, it's the things that I was mentioned to you. So all the possible um, tones that you might use, like 100 colors, you put it here. But in case, and then afterwards, you create the semantic one. So what's the real magic here is that when you're doing this and you're creating the semantics, for instance, I want to say that my, uh, accents, uh, let me see background. My background accents is brand red. So if I change the brand red, it will also change this ones and you will see the magic now. So if I change this one, let me just put it a little bit here so you can see it. If I change this fellow, it will change all because it will change the source. Right, so because I define it, my background accents as this color brand red and I change it, it will also update it here. So you can see the potential of this when you are doing things in scale, because instead of you know, making the, the, the update of individually or you don't know where you already use the color because there are so many components, you make sure that all the source of truth is defined here on your collection of variables. So I will just put it here. And this goes to every type of color. So you can see it uh, in every type of color. This one will not be seen because you don't have anything. So same goes here. So it's automatically uh, the update and it's very satisfying. And with styles, you don't have that. So in case you have to change a value for some reason, you have to do it manually. You have to make sure that it's updated in everywhere. You have to publish that again. And with variables, it's so much easy to do that sync because you know that they are connected with each other. And that's the real magic behind it. And for this, I basically did um, a bigger uh, demo of this with uh, a very, very slighted makeover uh, web page of Domino's. So please don't, don't, don't judge me if this is not the best experience or whatever. I just did a very UI uh, rebrand. And this has also a, a, a very uh, funny inside joke. Uh, I have a Domino's right across uh, in the back of my building. And so I usually do the takeaway and so on. But they did a rebrand of the website, but it was not 100% the best. So I was very attached to the patterns of the, the old website even though it might seem worse. And then I would know if I was too tired or anything, I ordered a pizza without any toppings 
<laughs> and there they were quite like comfortable about it because it seems it was a, a very common thing and then I went to the store and then I got home and I'm like there are no toppings here <laughs> and I was so disappointed and so now I thought let, let me just do like in the in the in the my world the fictional world how my web page would would be in case I would order a pizza of course I just do a very slight home page this would will require a tons of homepage, but that's the reason why I'm I'm using this as a as a demo. Um so basically how we'll show you today. I show you basically what I find out by using variables and also to introduce you a little bit uh, of the things that might uh, be possible to use vari uh, variables, which is modes. So modes are something that they are quite attractive to use. They are a little bit overwhelming when you don't know right away how to use it. And that's what I will teach you and uh, show you today. But once they're uh, working, it's like magic. You feel like so powerful, like, oh, this is working and this is actually awesome to use. So basically what did I did here? So I started to create some components here. Uh, so basic, very basic uh, stuff, okay. So I did some buttons, I did some uh, elements and components so I can create here my deal card and then I did a, this menu card. And then basically the main things that I tried today regarding modes is to have a mode for desktop and mobile. And then afterwards also a mode for light and dark um, colors. So regarding color, the light and dark mode. So how would this process? Um, so I start to, to dig in and do all, you know, the components, right? I start to create it, um, you know, the properties to have text here to so I can write the text uh, if I want it or not. Uh, the image on the mobile version for some reason, because it would be more mobile friendly, I guess. Um, and then I dig in and I wanted to say, okay, I want to make sure that and I will now copy here a uh, screen. So one second, so you can see the magic with me. So let's say that I want to make sure that when I have a card that is defined, that it will be desktop. And for some reason, I wanna make sure that the designer, once it starts to do the mobile version, already has that, it doesn't have to have a variant for it. When I have the mode here, basically when I put it here, it should, and because I'm teaching you, it won't work. Ah, okay, it's the same bug that it was giving me last time, but maybe let's try with the with the menu. I think the menu will work. Yeah, Murphy's law, it's always like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I try this and of, of course, okay, this will work. Um, yeah, so for instance, I want to make sure that the navigation on desktop is always like that, but once it's mobile, it will be different. So if I put my navigation here, it will change it, voila. And you're kind of like, oh, that's so wonderful. How can I do that? So regarding this, for instance, what Figma recommends you now, and for me, it's a little bit awkward, to be honest, it's a little bit challenging for people that are not quite uh, familiar with, you know, um, but the phone does not change. Uh, probably it's because I didn't ask for to change because inside of the components, but we will get there, but it's a good point. So how do I do this type of voodoo, basically? Um, you create first the modes. So when you're creating the mode, what do you have to do? You have to create first a collection dedicated to that. I've tried to put it here on a semantic, but it doesn't work because it will conf conflict with other modes that you might have here. So what you do is that you create a collection, create a collection. For instance, I put it here, a collection dedicated to resolutions. And then here, and this is the, the strange thing, you have to create a string va variable. So string. And then you put here, uh, I, I, I call it screen size, but you can call it whatever. You call it res resolution or screen size or whatever. And then you put here on the modes, desktop, mobile, and then you repeat it and put des desktop and mobile. After that, what do you do? This is basically uh, the logic that Figma needs to identify 
on the variance of your components. So this string variable is the connection that Figma will do on your components. So if we go here, you might be already seeing that once I have this uh, first here, so here I have the component, right? Uh, let me just ungroup. So we have your navigation. And then what I do after, I go here on my component and then I create a new variant. And on the new variant, I call it screen size. And this name is crucial to be the same on the string val variable. Otherwise you won't recognize the connection. So this will also call uh, screen uh, size and here as well, desktop and mobile. So what Figma does is that he basically do, does this connection when here I have screen size and he will attach the screen size. And this is this basically is what allows us to make the magic. And on the layer one, on the artboard part, we go here and we use layer. And on the layer part, I can basically define my modes. And this is where it gets tricky. So if I change this to mobile, uh, basically I define here what this, for instance, it doesn't have it. Okay. So here, uh, I will just demo this one that's already working. So as you can see, this is quite challenging sometimes to understand where it is working or not. But basically we go here and we define the resolution that we want for this artboard regarding the layer. And you can also do this mode, whether it is on your page even. So you can put it here, which is quite insane. I haven't tried it. You could put it on the level of your artboard, or you can put it inside and on each component or each uh, frame. And you have here on the left side, which ones are saying desktop or whatnot. So as you can see, this has a lot of possibilities and a lot of potential. You can use modes inside of an artboard in multiple ones. You can just define it already at the whole artboard and will basically define the whole mode of the artboard. Or you can even define that this page will all be dark mode, this page itself. So it's quite amusing, but it's still overwhelming to see all the possibilities working, right? So uh, regarding desktop and mobile is this, it could be, you know, not useful for everybody. So you have to measure how modes you want to, to use and in which situation, because for you, it might be not relevant to have this component on mobile or desktop, but let's say light and dark mode, for instance, I found this very useful. So how, how did I do that? For instance, uh, I already go here on the semantic one. And first, when you are creating a, a, a collection, I will create one so you can understand. So this is a new collection. And when you are creating something like color one, the main uh, predefinition is that you have a name and then you have a value. In case you want to create more modes, if you go here and you click this uh, error, you create two modes. And that's here when you have the possibilities of putting light and dark, or for instance, if you want to use languages, let's say English and, uh, English and Portuguese, because you have Portuguese here. Um, and let's say that I want to, to say that my buttons, texts, whatever, uh, in English, it will be order now, and then on Portuguese will be uh, encomenda, encomenda It's not that fancy, but it will basically, it's the direct translation. So um, basically this is how you create a mode. And in case you would like to use this um, option, for instance, for your button texts, like to guarantee that every time that is in Portuguese, you say encomenda agora. And every time that it's English, it's, you'd say order now. So you use this bu bu button text. We can try to use it here and let's see if it goes, hopefully. Uh, and then for instance, you can use it here and you can put a variable of button text. So every time that you are using afterward modes, in case I would put here that this page will be on Portuguese, which I will not guarantee that will work, but eventually this button will change the text for encomenda agora. 
So as you can see, this has a lot of potential and then you have to analyze how do you do it. And you have to mostly test a lot before making sure that you are implementing and uh, using this with other people as uh, design system guardians or even as a product designer that does this uh, not that often. So for instance, on the light and dark mode, it was more easy to, to see the results. So for instance, what did I did? I went to the semantic collection and this is quite interesting for me. I'm not sure about the audience, but for instance, without modes, what I did usually did is that I have, for instance, a text default color. And usually when I wanted to try to create a dark mode, I would create an inverse one. But with Figma, I don't have to use, I don't have to create that because if I define the default one on the light, he already gives me the space to define the dark one. So I don't have to use this inverse anymore, you know, because I don't have to manually do the inverse color. So this will have a huge impact on how you name things because you might be used to like default inverse or a background um, primary and then I don't know, inverse again. So it it really it could really impact the way that you are naming things. Instead of using primary, secondary, you can use other names and you can define already here the values of it. So basically if I put here, and let me see if I get this again and do this while wow factor. I tested, but you never know when you're alive, right? But in case you wanted, for instance, to change this, all of this to the dark mode, because the colors are already well defined, you can just go here and voila, it will change. <laughs> That's so exciting. But until you get here, you kind of like, mm, okay, you have to really understand um, how each color um, substitute uh, in light and dark mode. So it could be also quite challenging if you're not seeing it, you know, because if it's not well defined here, you cannot see it here, the results properly, for instance. And I already seen here uh, a default because I have here some colors that were supposed to be here, but you will apologize me. But that's the, the main magic besides it is that when it's well defined, because you have all the colors, it will be a lot of magic. So you can also do it here, for instance, this one will also work. So I put just your dark and voila, all of that will be translated. So um, the main uh, pros and cons that I see here, when we are creating variants at the past, I would have to basically create more variants for the dark mode, right? The usual behavior is to create here, for instance, a variant, but I put a uh, theme or mode, and I would just put light and dark. And then I would put all the six variants here, you know, and put it here on this collection. But with the mode part, you don't have to do it. So here I see a huge potential of reducing a lot of having variants. And instead of having multiple ones, I can define on modes and reduce here uh, all of the properties. This can be good or, or bad. For instance, me and B3 is also mentioned briefly together and we will like your opinion because sometimes we use uh, the file for components as a documentation. So let's say that we are defining this button, but there's no variance here on the dark mode. How will developers or other designers that will uh, use your Figma file as documentation will see the preview of the dark mode. So here you rely a lot on how variables are defined because you don't see the results here right away on Figma unless you are designing the screens, you know? It could be good, it could be bad. For instance, maybe for the designer, it's not relevant to have all the variants and just use modes and just put it already automatically the dark mode and that's it because he doesn't have to think about it. But in case they want to understand why, uh, it could be interesting at least to have to do this exercise of having an artboard and put it on the dark mode and afterwards you will see how it would look like. So it really depends on the way you're working and how your design system is organized and how people manage it. But it was a good topic because in case you reduce the variance here, how can I preview? How would that look? For instance, we already 
talk about desktop and mobile or even uh, light and dark or even language. But for instance, let's say that we have a button that is medium and small. If I have variables properly defined, I can even take out this, uh, this size and just put it on the variables. Now, on which mode would that be? It will be just medium and small. It will be just on the mobile version that I will only have smaller buttons. So it really depends how you want to apply the results of each mode, basically. Then as you can see, it gets really tricky and you have a lot of enthusiasm when you're trying to explore. Um, but at least uh, I have some difficulties regarding sometimes things working out because as you as you can see, I, I was trying to put it this working out for you and then I have some bugs. Um, how to put it uh, working modes on the file. So for instance, let's create it out of the blue again. So in case I wanted to use my navigation, once that I put it here, at first, it won't have any association of that string. What you have to do is put it here on this uh, variable symbol, the screen size. Otherwise, you will not rec rec uh, recognize that this has a mode attached. So this is quite tricky to understand. You have to make sure that you do this connection and I will do it again. So with the child of your component, you go here on the screen size and then you put the same string called screen size again. And this is basically where it makes all the magic work. Uh, and also here with this one, it will be the same process. Um, and sometimes I put it here, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. For instance, now this one already recognized it for some reason, and then I put it again just to make sure. Uh, so sometimes I'm already uh, trying to understand how we'll also uh, recognize. I think because this one already had uh, the string attached, this one already uh, recognized as well. So as you can see, this is quite complex when you're not 100% comfortable about it. So train a lot, do a lot of experiments before you launch anything to the society. Uh, the society, no, uh, your team, sorry. So, and then you can only activate the modes on your layer once you have components that have modes. So, because otherwise, if you, if you do uh, a new artboard, let's say this one, it won't appear the modes here on the layer, as you can see, it won't happen because and this is quite tricky. So it really depends on how you do the steps. He can only give you a choice of modes if you already have something inside with modes. So as, as you can see, it's quite tricky. For instance, this one, it doesn't have anything, but if I put here, he already asked me to, okay, then choose something. And then you go and put desktop. And then you put uh, like mode, and then you put uh, this in English support will not be for today. And then you put here again, uh, desktop. For instance, this one, I still don't figure it out why he asks me again on the global and the resolutions, because on the global one, as you recall, I didn't define anything but a, a value. So maybe for me, this seems like a bug, you know, like he needs to find another pair of value because we have your desktop and mobile for some reason. So in my opinion, this is weird why he asked me on the global to choose one of them. It should only ask for this one. In case you know the answer, feel free to reach out. Uh, so it's, it's always me to uh, show you how this could be also tricky, even though that you're uh, using this every day. Um, and basically, yeah, you have to have elements that have already some properties. For instance, this card image has a Boolean variable, and sometimes it, it works, sometimes it doesn't. So I'm still trying to understand also the Boolean variable. I still don't feel uh, the need of it because it's quite tricky to use it. And in case I have here uh, a property, it should work. And here, instead of, it will be mobile. So here, it's already, uh, now it works, okay. 
in case you have the element here and you choose a mobile, he would switch, right? So don't get overwhelmed in case you're not uh, going right away. You have to first basically go on your component and then create a variant and then have the string variable that is similar to the properties of your variant. And then on the screen, attach your string variable and then on the layer part, choose the mode. So I think this has a lot of improvement on the Figma side as well. And as you can see, uh, it has a lot of potential, but it's still very green in my opinion, but it could be good. So for instance, here on the variant part, I only need this two. And in, in the past, I would have to put this once, for instance. So it could be good, it could be bad. You have to evaluate internally, uh, how would you like to explore this? Um, now I will pass to Beatrice so he can also uh, show the awesomeness of having supernova when syncing in all, all the things that I've done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's a good segue. Uh, first of all, Raquel, your tips are uh, super valuable. Like, thank you so much for doing this work and finding yeah, a yeah, very no simple, streamlined way to explain how to do this. And uh, uh, taking uh, what you're saying, that this precisely happened to me uh, in feedback writing on what we've been discussing of how can we expand this and how can uh, we help our teams um <laughs> sure of course <laughs> how can we help our teams uh learn how to use this i was thinking i was testing out your library we we share this document and i was thinking how how teams can actually uh, use this perhaps i don't know if uh, we should offer perhaps frames with uh, modes applied to them so that teams can streamline and use this for their screens that they're going to design and yeah. it, because it's something uh, interesting and yeah. also it made me realize that the documentation is even more important now because there's uh, yeah, so much sure, nuances for sure. uh, yeah, for sure. with this so I'm going to share we have a lot of questions in the chat if you want to have a, a browse, <laughs> but meanwhile, I'll be sharing my screen. Um, uh, don't worry if we don't answer them. Well, there's a lot, a lot of questions. We will follow up. No worries there. So I believe you can see my Figma, correct? Yes. Okay. So uh, going back to what Raquel was saying, I'm just going to quickly show you and one of the reasons we're doing this webinar is because we last year at the end of the year released a plugin that allows you to connect uh, precisely these variables to supernova and i'm i was trying we're still learning right this is uh, new and uh, i'm trying i try to explore how we could expand this that raquel showed to us and so this file is the same file as raquel in a different page it explains here how you can connect uh, your theme, uh, your the supernova workspace to the plugin, etc. It's pretty straightforward and fast, and it has here a little a summary of what you can do with it. But I'm gonna show you. Let's see how it goes live. Let's um, see. Let's see. <laughs> let's see. Let's see. So I already have a setup design system that I'll be showing you, of course. But I'm gonna show you. So this is my workspace, and I have a lot of design systems. <laughs> and I have this Domino's MT design system. You can see my uh, Chrome, right? Yes, yes. Okay, At cool. least I can see it. Yeah. So yes, we are gonna show share the Figma file, Ricardo, yes, uh, and also the recording. Uh, yeah, it will be my Figma community profile, but also on Supernova as well. So we yes, we can yes. See it. Yeah. yeah. So this is an MT design system that we have here in supernova and connecting the this is important for people that are used to using uh we have a concept which is called a data source but for connecting figma variables we do it through a plugin this is how it looks if you have uh, essentially just to give you a mapping here uh, we connect we do the hierarchy of the what figma calls collections we connect the collections and we also uh, do aliasing of your tokens. So if you're going to 
pass uh, uh, push your semantic tokens to supernova, we will also push your global tokens, your raw values, uh, so that because they have a link, otherwise they wouldn't have a value. Uh, value correct. And this is just uh, a warning or an inform extra information about that. And essentially, it's pretty simple. You push to supernova, uh, we sync, and then magic happens. <laughs> we'll see. It's a kind of magic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> it, it worked. Wonderful. So if I go now to supernova uh, and I refresh my supernova, there will be a ta-da. Ta-da! Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> they are here and they are uh, linked. Like I mentioned, we pass your uh, the modes you created uh, in Supernova. They're called themes, and we also uh, pass the what what collection they belong to, so you can govern yourself better. And just a, another note: Raquel was changing some values here, and I wanted to show you. This is my other design system. They already had uh, it connected. It shows you what is up to date and what was modified. Ah, that's good. That's yeah. good. Yeah. What is it was modified uh, in your collections, and you can push to supernova the changes. So I'm going to update so we talk about the same most updated design system. So I'm going to go to the Domino's non empty one, the one that I was playing around with. I think I, I might also be able to share this with you, the documentation. So I think everyone can just have a, a browse around. And I was thinking how we could uh, expand this and, and what it means for us. Uh, there's a lot of questions I see in the chat about this. And it is this notion of abstraction of how we do our naming conventions for tokens. And it's awesome that it gets closer and closer to um, code. And, and it's important, again, I'm repeating myself, how we document things and how we share with our teams this logic. Yeah, yeah. And so um, I was trying to play around with Supernova and see how uh, uh, we could uh, essentially report this logic. And I tried to see what Raquel did and, and try to expose it. So let's say we have our, Raquel started with the global tokens, which are our, what we call base etc. And then she uh, attributed semantic tokens on, on the top of this layer. And another layer to this are the modes and how the, the this architecture could work. What we offer for you out of the bat uh, is we have specialized uh, blocks that help you document really easily and fast uh, your tokens. This is how the render documentation and this is an example of the editor itself in Supernova. And uh, you can create uh, the architecture that best fits you best. But uh, you can just simply, this is a, a token block that you can connect your tokens to, frankly, quite easily. And you can uh, document them whatever makes more sense uh, to you. Another thing that we do is that uh, you can enable properties and choose uh, which ones to show or not. And you can show the modes uh, in Supernova. Mm -hmm. And if you publish, we can you can share with your team the applied modes. And this could be an interesting solution for what uh, we were discussing about how we're going to show the variants because we were very yeah. Yeah. To rely on these. And what I was thinking, I was trying to use the card component as an example. Um, in I don't uh, in Supernova we have this concept of components, so you can essentially uh, document. It's a, a, a tracking a spreadsheet that we allow you to associate to your Figma components. And if I op I can, for example, oh, open so them, <laughs> open <Yeah>. them in Figma. <laughs> And it, depending yeah. on how your team organizes themselves, you can also attribute properties to mm -hmm. these components. And let's say you're transitioning to uh, applying color themes and Figma variables. You can, for example, track here if you already did the, the transition to that component or not. And oh, you can good. exhibit that in your documentation. Um, and so going back to what I was saying, uh, Another thing that we could do, and that is possible, 
is that we allow you to render Figma frames that are uh, updated on every time you, you make a change. So uh, we could, for example, use this to uh, show uh, the different uh, variants uh, we have and also perhaps use the token block that I showed you um, that could show you the different modes and communicating these things is, is uh, sometimes tricky. But like, firstly, maybe explaining the, the, that question of how we architect things and the like these levels of abstraction and then trying to go to the details and how people can troubleshoot because we're more and more uh, relying less on variables, I suppose, but getting closer to code, which is a really good thing, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, especially because I didn't explore, but it was also another dilemma that I would have to, that I would like to share with on the code syntax on the variable itself. And I think Supernova might help that a lot because it will be here more exposable on how do you name your variables regarding the code syntax. So I think that probably is something that Figma would need to help uh, people to write the code syntax because for instance, when you're using light and dark mode, I will just mm -hmm. show you sure, briefly. Yeah, please, please. Uh, so you can understand my dilemma, let's say. <laughs> but so these are like, like Raquel yeah. said, we're learning and, and you're, I see yeah. so many suggestions. I'm looking forward to reading everything that you guys have yeah. been sharing. But, yeah. So for instance, yeah. uh, the dilemma that I was mentioning about having a default and inverse color on the syntax, you would put like background default and background inverse, for instance. But once you have light and dark mode, if you want to, to say that this uh, variable will have a code syntax, which is something that you could put it here mm -hmm. when you have code codec, code syntax, um, and then you click uh, two times, this property will be named on the token, on the CSS part content default. And you might think, okay, but how will that have the intelligent if I want to go here? It will also have the same name because it's on the same uh, uh, property, right? So maybe here, that's when the tricky part gets in and maybe this would be a uh, content uh, default white, um, sorry, dark. Uh, and then this one should have um, a content default light. But as you can see, he has the same code syntax. So I was wondering how would that work when we have the sync with a repo who will have the intelligence to understand the different colors on light and dark mode. And probably Supernova might help with that sync because it will help to, you know, to divide the, the, the themes itself. Because yeah. on Figma, it seems it's a little bit struggling, you know, because as you can see, I change on this side and he corrects and give the same property name. So it will be- And the, at the mode level, you, you don't, you can't change anything, no. No, no, not yet. Not yet. Because that could be also interesting. Like yeah, a, a, no, like, a domain name, right? Perhaps. Uh, you no, were... like at the end of the syntax, for example, it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. CSS BEM, where you add uh, like yeah, 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 yeah. levels. But totally it, get you. We, yeah. we do uh, allow you to assign code properties and, and render yeah. To code and it's something I'm I need to explore and uh, an article will come out about it soon. Yeah, but that is actually a very good question of how could we set up this environment where we could streamline those th that communication part. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think that would be interesting for a lot of people. Like how would actually translate it and maybe Supernova might help at the moment with that translation. At least here is very design friendly. So for a designer, it only has to be concerned about defining the color on light and dark mode, but thinking about the other extra steps, how would that would be possible on the code with this code syntax might be interesting to see the future steps regarding Figma and as well, how you have the solution on Supernova. So that might be interesting yeah, I'll, as well. I'll note that I'm gonna yeah. also <laughs> No pressure, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> and, and gonna... Yeah. Have answers. Good, great questions. Yeah. Uh, so I think we're uh, it's almost there. I think we could uh, jump for the Q and A's. Yes, yes. Okay. How shall we choose this? Um, I skipped a question by mistake, 
from Sean. And uh, I don't know if you have any, uh, Sean asks, should we name, should the names in the semantic collection be more agnostic than what you're demonstrating? Uh, do you have any opinions on how to name tokens is it, or variables? Is it something besides what yeah. we talked now about code? Yeah, so any... I think the, the tricky part on semantic is that the more detached, the more um, possibilities might have to scale in the future. Because if you put already background primary, the primary could be very tricky, uh, at least in my opinion, to uh, apply in other situations, like what is exactly primary. And let's say you have a brand that has two main colors and usually uh, use primary for one main color. But let's say that you have the two, like Domino's has, for instance, when you have a blue and a red, how do you call the primary? Would it be the red, would it be the blue, uh, would it be the one that is more often used, would it be the one that is usually um, on the background that it's fooled. So mm -hmm. primary could be tricky for me. But if you put it like, I don't know, background accent or standard, which is something that Adobe use it a lot, the accent and the center. For me, it could be more uh, agnostic friendly because it's more open to possibilities. So uh, I think it really, you really have to try on the, 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 the needs of your brand. Let's say you have a multi-brand design system. It could be totally different whether a brand has four main colors or just one color. So you really have to try uh, with a ton of components and see how much difficulty you have oh, no. uh, when have using lost that. Raquel or is it me? Ah. Oh, you lost me? No? Can Is anyone on the chat? Can tell me if... It's good? Okay. Beatrice, you're here? You're here now? Okay. <laughs> you are... Okay, I don't listen to you, but just double checking if someone does not hear Beatrice as well. Okay, uh, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, let's hopefully that Beatrice will. will... Okay, <laughs> you're here. <laughs> we already I'm missed back. you. We're so little. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's yeah. We have this meme which is our office internet, and I'm living it now. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. No Sorry worries. to interrupt Every... everyone. Yeah, yeah, no worries. So, but regarding the name, uh, the name of the of the semantic, uh, you really have to try it all possible uh, nomenclatures that it's out there, and yeah, try to be as neutral as possible and see. For instance, on the inverse default, maybe you could put it like highlight instead of using the inverse and highlight. It could be different in light and dark mode. So you really have to see your needs. Um, in case, for instance, you might not have a dark mode. For, for instance, because sometimes you don't have yet uh, implemented on your uh, company. So really do this uh, current situation of mapping what you have and then see the difficulties of the nomenclature that you have now and try to use variables to see how it goes as an exercise. Yeah, naming is hard. <laughs> yeah, think... yeah, naming is like a whole science. Yes, it, it's, there's sure. <laughs> a whole like three even, webinars about it. And yeah, I, yeah, I, for sure. I, I shared uh, Nathan Kirch is, is a, a very big inspiration. I, and I share this article. Uh, I'm going to share it in the main, uh, general chat if you want to read more about how naming tokens and variables. And I think it's quite applicable and just a follow up reading on this. Yeah. And judging by the questions, a lot of names were about, uh, pardon, a lot of questions are about how to name things and code syntax. Mm -hmm. um, let me see. More questions. There's a, a technical question about uh, from Tina. Seeing mm -hmm. if you have a mode applied to an artboard. Oh, but there, it had an answer. Um, yeah, yeah, so it, what it, I showed today is actually that you can apply modes on page, on the artboard, and inside of the artboard on some components and elements. So you have the, the all levels of applying modes, which it could be, as you can imagine, quite, <laughs> quite complex. <laughs> so yes, yes, you can uh, do that. Um, yeah, there's also someone that asked a question, um, 
if you could use different modes for different brands. And I think you can and you should. Just uh, a warning in case you have organizational plan, you can only go up to four modes on each collection. But in case you have an enterprise, I think you can go until 40 or 50. I'm not sure, but it's quite a big number. So as you can see, the possibilities are quite huge. Uh, but I think often people will have more is until organizational plan. So on each collection, you have until four modes. When we have light and dark, you can have, I don't know, uh, other uh, color modes that you would like to have. So you have four modes of each collection. Yeah. And just, collections are limited? You mentioned uh, the collection. collection, I don't think so, but the modes itself are. So mm -hmm. until organization, you have until four. And above the enterprise, you have, I think, if it's not 40, I think it's 50. I'm not 100% sure, but you can check on the Figma packages as well. Um, regarding text size, uh, there's also a question here. Figma will also launch in the future, not only for text size uh, variants, because you can now only choose the size itself. You don't you don't still store the fonts and the spacing and so on. That would be huge, but they will launch soon. At least that's what uh, they promise on the future releases and pressure. And also gradients, they also plan to launch gradients. So if you want to choose at least the text size, you can also use variables. You just have to find the, you know, that's a little um, wheel. And in case you don't see the wheel, you can do button right and try to see if there's apply variable because sometimes it's hidden. It's also tricky <laughs> sometimes to see it. Amazing. You're... Yeah, as you can see, I passed some time exploring <laughs> and see if what, what works or doesn't. Tips and <laughs> tricks with Raquel. You're, yeah. you're an expert. <laughs> uh, let me see other. Uh... Oh, we're at the hour, but we could do maybe one more question if you see any. Yeah, just to see if it was something slightly different. Can you imagine a versioning of tokens or variables in the design system? I believe it would work the same way as when you publish a library of components, because when you publish, you will have the same behavior. So once you are publishing a component, it will all also uh, ask you to publish the, the, the library itself. And, and actually that reminds me a great feature that I mm -hmm. didn't share, my bad. As you can see, there's a lot of information. For instance, let's say that you define a global collection, but you don't want all of the people to know this because you it might be not relevant to share with all the people. What you can do, for instance, let's say that I don't want to people to, to, to see my global uh, values on um, published libraries. When I do edit, edit variables, I can hide it from publishing. So I activate this mode, this uh, option. And I can also uh, choose where these variables are available from. So for instance, I have it here on the semantic one, the strokes, Sizes, for instance, it would only be visible on stroke and nothing, nowhere else. Regarding gapping, I can see it only on the gap. So you can even use this type of uh, properties to define your variables in, in case you are wondering what you should define or what not. I also put the padding here on, I think this one is actually on a lot of them, I'm not sure. Uh, but you can choose basically where to put the, the values. For instance, on the global ones, the number, I, I just put it a scale. And I think my scale is available, uh, uh, for instance, on layer opacity and effects. So you can also choose where to see these variables. And this might change uh, when you're doing things. So for instance, when I'm changing the padding here, as you can see here, uh, again, the little secret wheel. It will only provide me the lists that I uh, made possible for me to see at this um, spec, you know, at paddings or gaps. So this could be also interesting. Let, let's say that you want not to show all the things that you define and you can specify which variables should people see in which uh, specific um, property, which I think it's quite interesting as well.
Amazing, Raquel. I, we're past the time, unfortunately, yeah. for having yeah. so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> and um, thank you, everyone, for participating. I'm so happy. It was such a... Um, everyone was so active in sharing their thoughts with us. Uh, we're really glad. And it was super fun. We hopefully will do more things. And now that we've met each other, and I'm also... Uh, creating more contact for supernova more opportunities will come and thank you so much this was so valuable and looking forward thank you all you to were the a rest. great audience <laughs> yes absolutely this was so much fun and yeah. <laughs> uh we'll share everything like we said um and uh the recording the file and i will share also the supernova uh workspace and if you pardon documentation, if you have any questions, reach out to both of us. I'm sure we'll be happy to keep on contacting and see you. Have a great next uh, next days of the week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And happy New Year! I think. Yes, this happy, time New Year. Still. <laughs> happy New Year! Happy New Year, all. And thank you so much. It thank was a you. blast. Yes. Thank absolutely. you. Bye. Enjoy. Thank you.